I call the Maplewood City Council work session to order on October 10th, 2023. Mr. Nyberg, roll call, please. Council Member Correll. Here. Council Member Falkenham. Here. Council Member Garcia. Here. Council Member Homa. Here. Mayor Knapper. Here. Council Member Maddox. Here. Council Member Page. Here. Mayor, we have a quorum. Thank you. Mr. Nyberg, item number four, please. Interview of Arika Moore, candidate for Maplewood Municipal Judge. Thank you. So as uh, you all saw in the memo that I provided, that our current municipal judge, Honorable Brandy Herndon Miller, will be resigning from her position as municipal mayor for Maplewood on October 23rd. And uh, very happy for her. She has accepted a position on the bench for the County of St. Louis. And so that will leave our bench vacant. And because of that, I have reached out to attorney Erika Moore and asked her if she would be interested in serving in that capacity. And she said, yes. And so uh, her resume was attached to the memo that I provided. However, I would just like to let you all know the reason why I sought out attorney Moore for this uh, potential appointment. So I think you all are aware that I am a former public defender and being a criminal defense attorney for indigent, indigent people has been extremely um, life-changing, eye-opening for me. Uh, being a public defender is difficult, especially when many times you are told by your own client, you're not a real lawyer, you're just a public pretender. Yes, and you still, through all of that, verbal abuse that you get from your own clients, you make sure that you represent them with uh, zealous advocacy. And I have seen that same work that I have done in Attorney Moore. She represents her indigent clients to the fullest and to the utmost capacity that she has. I think that she is an outstanding attorney because uh, she continues to serve in her capacity as a special public defender to this day. Um, so I will just tell you, yes, I am biased when it comes to a public defender because I know the work that they're doing and I know that they care about our community. Excuse me. And so with that being said, I wanted to change the way that I have made this appointment in the past. In the past, I just followed our charter, which essentially says I could choose someone and then I present that name to you and you all um, vote on the the name, if you will. You didn't really get a chance to meet the person or talk to the person unless unless you wanted to, unless you sought them out on your own. And I wanted to be transparent with this process uh, and allow the community to see the person that I would like to appoint, allow you all to ask questions at one time of, of this person. And so uh, without any further ado, I would like to invite Attorney Moore to the podium. And Ms. Moore, you gotta forgive us. Uh, we're gonna make you work. You have to push the button the entire time when you talk. Um, but if you just remember to do that, you'll be fine. And so at this time, I'd like to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself uh, and then let us know whatever you'd like to about yourself in your capacity as an attorney and the work that you've done. And then you may have some questions from counsel. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Like she said, my name is attorney Erika Moore. I've been practicing law since 2011. <laughs> I've been mostly criminal law and I have done special public defender work for quite a bit of that time, which has given me a unique perspective into my understanding of how the court system can be a resource to the community as much as it can be an advocate for making sure that we prevent repeat offenders and other types of crime from, you know, running rampant and being prevalent. I went to undergrad at Mizzou and law school at Georgia State, and practicing law has been rewarding for a lot of reasons. One, because 
Uh, like I said, I get to be a resource through being a special public defender, but also I get to participate in other things such as I teach a legal workshop through, I don't know if you guys have heard of this program called Pathways to Home and other programs like that that provide legal assistance to people who are transitioning out of the jail system back home. Because what we found is that a lot of times people get confronted with challenges as soon as they get out, and that encourages them to commit more crimes or to repeat offend. And so being able to help them get rid of traffic offenses through the program, to um, give them legal advice about child support or family law and things like that, we think has had a tremendous impact on the community. And it's one of those things that I didn't necessarily foresee as an opportunity when I went into law school that I've just been fortunate enough to, to be a part of at this point. And so I think that practicing law has been rewarding, challenging for sure, <laughs> but rewarding. And I think that this opportunity would be an excellent opportunity to continue to be a resource to the community. And I'm looking forward to uh, answering any questions that you guys have. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, I assume you know plenty about Maplewood. I didn't look on the resume to see if you're a resident or not, but that doesn't matter. Um, you know, so we're a community that I think you know we believe in the rule of law and 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 you know that, that you know we want our citizens to be law abiding and all that. But there's an intersection of also a progressive community and where that intersects with law enforcement and all that. What, what challenges do you see there as the judge and, and how would you deal with that as as the judge to the special unique challenges of a community that wants to be law abiding and, and follow those rules, but also wants to be sensitive to the context that the person that broke the law is coming from? Does that make sense? Perfect sense. I think the important thing is to lead with kindness and an understanding that while I'm a lawyer and I'm in the legal system all day long, the majority of people are not. And when they get into the legal system, especially coming before a judge, they're normally scared. They don't know how the process works. And if we come to them with, you know, aggression and kind of, you know, um, hoping that they just know what they're supposed to do and that they act right, it's just going to create more tension and frustration for everyone. And so I think that especially for a progressive community, showing that you understand that people come from diverse backgrounds, that people are dealing with life and problems bigger than maybe what the challenge they're facing here is today. And that, you know, just giving them a little bit of kindness and a little bit of guidance to hopefully prevent them from being back in front of us. And I think that's the best way to, to restore the relationship with the community, to let them know that the courts are actually a resource and are actually on their side and that we're working with police officers and with the city to make sure that not only are we saying these things, but we're proving these things when they actually interact with us. Great, thank you. Just one question from me. First, thanks for coming and, and then allowing us to get to meet you and talk with you a little bit. Uh, only question I have is about your role as a special public defender in St. Charles. Uh, wonder if you just tell us a little bit about the scope of the work you do in here and what kind of crimes you're defending against, like what you see most often in highest volume, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, as a special public defender, uh, maybe a lot of people may not know that what happens is, is that two people commit a crime together and they both need a public defender. The public defender's office cannot represent both of them because there could be a potential conflict of interest. And so sometimes what special public defenders are called conflict attorneys. And so they transfer one of the cases to a private attorney or a special public defender to handle the case. And we have the ability to gauge what type of, you know, crimes we are willing to uh, take on. And so even though I put St. Charles County, because that's where my office is based, I have represented clients in St. Charles, St. Louis, St. Louis City, Lincoln, Franklin, lots of places <laughs> in Warren County. So if you're willing, Boone County, well, they'll let you drive where I'm going to go. <laughs> but for the majority of the cases that I have chosen to accept are C, D, and E felonies and misdemeanors. And so in West County, I think predominantly a lot of the cases that I have been confronted with have been drug cases and drug-related cases. So that would be stealing, simple assaults, things of that nature. Um, but again, once a person gets assigned a felony, you get all of their cases. So even if it's something you know that you're typically used to, you may get an outlier every now and again. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Okay. Do you have any questions for us? <laughs> no, just thank you for having me. And this has been a great opportunity to come in and actually meet people who are running the city to discuss, you know, what my kind of position is as far as how I think running a court should work. And I think that's a great way to start a good relationship. Okay. Thank you. All right, so I just want to follow up on an additional matter that I placed in the memo regarding item number four, and that is the training, the mandatory training that a new uh, municipal judge has to take. That training is offered really, I think, once a year, excuse me, and it is October 13th, so that is this Friday, yes, and so if the council believes that it would support my appointment of uh, Ms. Moore, then we will need to move forward with um, enrolling her and paying for that registration. And so if I could just, I don't know, yes, yes, I know, right? If I, could, if I could just get like an understanding or a consensus that you do support this, this, okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Awesome. Then um, Matt, we will we'll work together to make sure that we can get that taken care of. Okay, thank you. All right, so then um, the appointment of Attorney Moore will be on the October 24th agenda. And then um, she will be out of the state that week. And so I will also uh, talk with Matt to see if we can have her swearing in ceremony on November 30th. And it, that would be very quick because we don't have, it wouldn't be a part of a meeting or anything. So she would just come swearing. We might have some cake and then we'd all go. Okay. All right. Thank you all. I appreciate that. And then let me just ask, did you all like that process? Because it's, it's new. Okay. Okay. All right. Awesome. Yeah. No, no, no. I think it was good. Yeah. No. No. Good question. So um, I'll just repeat the question. Um, Chastity asked if we're going to have a lapse in time, like a judge being present for our municipal court because Brandy is going and we will not. We're covered. And then uh, even if Brandy, let's say, let's say we didn't have an appointment until sometime in November and we had like the end of November and, and we had municipal court, we would have a provisional judge come in. Yeah. Yeah. So we're covered. I'm sorry, I, uh, the timing, you said the swearing in on the 30th. Yes. What would be the timing on that on the 30th? We don't know yet. Or... Oh, we don't know yet. Okay. What was best for you? I guess it's just really for counsel. No, she, she'll, she'll be good. <laughs> okay. So like what, five, six? <clears throat> Is, does five or six, which one works for five? Five. Yeah, either one. You sure? Yeah, I live in Maplewood. Okay. I work in Maplewood. I look for any excuse to leave my job or else. Thank you. How about 5 30? Hey. November 30th, 5 30. Such the compromiser. <laughs> okay. And this will be like 15 minutes or less. I think more time will probably be the celebration and eating of cake. Yes. All right, thank you all. Um, Mr. Nyber, item number five, please. Citywide transportation study. All right, so we finally have the um, transportation study. And I wanted to put this on the work session agenda so you all would have an opportunity to look at it briefly, really, uh, because it, it's it's substantial. So. Yes. So um, if, if you have any questions right now, based on what you saw, we can discuss them, but we will have a presentation provided to us uh, at the next council meeting. I just wanted to start the discussion now because I know that within each ward, council members are receiving communications and questions from our, our community members about the progress of the traffic study and you know what what's in it, what can be done. I can tell you right now that in Ward 
one uh, residence on Flora. I can't, I don't know the, the block number, but where um, you're in, let's see, Flora, that's like the corner has the the church, right? Is that like the 70, yeah, is that like the 7,400? Is it 74? Awesome sauce. So the 7,400 block of Flora that crosses over Big Ben, and then so that that leads up to Laclede, they want um, speed bumps. And they've wanted speed bumps for a very long time, which is understandable because I've actually witnessed cars speed race on Flora and then also on Laclede Station Road. So I'm really just giving you all an example of what I heard mm -hmm. in 2001. Well, yeah. I've heard I've heard Yale too and Bellevue. So, anyways. Right. It's no, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's everywhere. It's like every, I, um, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say like speed bumps are fantastically helpful where I used to live in South County was the speed race turnaround neighborhood for Lindbergh cruising. And we put speed bumps in, in this condo complex. They put like four in and Saturday nights became speeding, hearing cars bottom out, hearing people scream curse words and then never coming back. So it was, I mean, it was very entertainingly effective for all of us who were like, yeah. Um, not entertainingly effective. Maybe we could work a camera in with the speed bumps and watch the car. I, yeah, I was like, hey, you know, if you had gone 15 miles an hour, you wouldn't have bottomed out. But um, I, I just had some general questions about the survey itself. Um, so I, I, if, I don't think I missed it, but there was no actual foot survey. Like no one walked around and looked for like, current visible issues or anything like that it was just self-reported and then the um the speed checks right so i'm going to look at anthony mr traxler <laughs> so um it was it was a combination there they is this oh, i'm sorry I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. no problem if i push that button it'll stay on i think ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really disappointed in you. <laughs> they all do it, but you can't leave it on the entire time because you'll begin to get feedback. Okay. At some point, especially if people are speaking from the Zoom call. <clears throat> but believe me, we went through all the testing for it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some are okay. So what's there so, like there were several um data sources. The first is they created a, a survey. They did not go door to door. But they attended numerous um, community events, the Taste of Maplewood. They attended um, the concert series. They went to neighborhood block parties when necessary. They, they made themselves very available. We also had two charrettes. We had one in the evening at City Hall, and we also had one during the day to try to pick up uh, people with different schedules. But they did not go door to door. Well, and I don't mean specifically like banging doors. I just mean like people walking the sidewalks and streets and looking for like, hey, is there a hole in the ground here? Is this a tripping hazard? Because like- that Staff was does that. They did not They did not do that. They were primarily focused on uh, traffic issues and traffic calming measures to correct some of those issues. Speeding was number one. Uh, ignoring traffic signals was uh, number two. And then um, lack of uh, pedestrian or bicycle safety options was mm -hmm. basically the third. Yeah. And I had, I had two more just overall process questions. So I'm going to cover those real quick. Um, it, the 145 responses, was that representative of the population within Maplewood? Like, was it, did you have the luxury of being able to say we need to have a certain volume from Ward 2 and Ward 1 and Ward 3? Or was it literally just, this is what we got, we're going to go with it? That's what they went with. They said it was pretty broad. As we asked, is it broad? We even um, posted these notices in, in apartment complexes, in common areas within apartment complexes. We had our housing inspectors reach out to all the apartment complexes to try to get, because they're usually the most difficult to get a hold of sometimes, because uh, it just it just works out that way. And so we we did a, a pretty pretty extensive effort to try to get as much feedback as possible. We also used, I had been collecting um my own data for about about seven or eight years. So any email I'd had in the past, I tucked it away in a file, sent it off to them. They went through probably three or 400 pages for me. 
We also got, we work with the police department on um, uh, and getting their data on complaints and actual speed violations as well. So they compiled all that data. It's not to say there's not some other spots in town that it was a squeaky wheel situation where they're not problems, but they did not get the detailed analysis. But we're going to use their methodologies and we're, we can go back much cheaper and basically gather the data, drop them into their tables, and then we can find out where problems exist. We've actually okay. already ordered, um, we have a, a new set of um, uh, speed monitoring equipment. Our last one's got, yeah. the cables got chopped up, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, we I haven't was... had them for a while. We got a new system that's nice because it captures traffic speeds going both directions as well. Yeah, that's great. Cause I was, I was just kind of wondering about that. And then my third question, just <laughs> from looking through the report, I mean, I understand it was a traffic calming survey and not necessarily like an incident survey, mm -hmm. but I didn't really have a good connection as to what the actual impact is of some of the things. Like the speeding numbers, I'm not going to lie. I had some raised eyebrows reading that. That was Rising. disconcerting. But like, I would have really appreciated saying, you know, hey, in the last five years, 10 years, we've had this many accidents on this stretch of road because there's problems and then there's problems and that might have helped me context you know contextualize a little more on some of the thoughts with it so that's not what they would specialize in but we as a staff can app easily compile that information that'd be fantastic yes, even just high level yeah i'll work with uh, chief neighbor and we'll make sure to get that um and, and put that in as more colony measures um i want to make when we get to the next item, which is the bond issue, I put five streets in there for traffic coming. I want to make sure everyone understands, because if you read the report, why didn't we do West Bruno? Obviously, that's a high priority area. That's not to say we're not going to eventually have some traffic calming measures, but we would need to work together with Richmond Heights and come up with a comprehensive approach. Um, uh, Manchester Road, um, Southwest were two others, but I'm keeping for the bond issue. I just want to make sure I'm, I don't mean to be blurring the two line items together. I wanted to keep that more for residential because it's going to be a vote of the people. Um, and so try to keep it away from the commercial areas. Um, Sutton Avenue, they had an interesting approach to elevate the intersection at Hazel. I thought that was a really interesting concept. And and there's some serious speeding numbers from uh, basically Elm <clears throat> north to Marietta. They get going pretty fast there. Um, and then, and then a couple of other interesting approaches, they were talking about chicanes on different areas. I, to simplify this process, I put speed bumps for my proposals, but that doesn't mean we can't use chicanes and bump outs and other traffic calming measures. We can tweak that. I just tried to simplify it for the bond discussion that's coming after this. There were a few things, there were a few, obviously some typos that we would correct that I've already forwarded on to the consultant. There was discussions about we need uh, pedestrian crossings at, at Oakland. We have one. Um, there was a discussion about West Bruno make, going from a minor collector to a major collector. That was an east-west gateway uh, initiated request. That's not a city request, and that's in there. I want to make sure to take that out because it's not accurate before it goes to the residents. I don't want them thinking we're trying to turn the road into a more commercial aspect. Um, but other than that, I, I thought... Um, I thought a lot of the recommendations were, were sound uh, and you'll see, I picked the five streets out. It wasn't just the study, but it was also working with the police department on where they get the most complaints. Uh, Lindover uh, South of Ryan Hummer park to me is, was really troubling. There were some people going, you know, 50, 60 miles an hour. That's a very narrow street. It's near a park. Uh, it's it. I, that was, that was surprising to me. Bellevue is concerning. There's a school right there. I get more. I get more emails on Bellevue than anything else. And the study showed it too. The Bell, they, they, they. That's a. So what? One thing that's really interesting, if if you're going through the study again, because you know we're gonna have some more time to kind of flesh out these details before Crawford Bunty Braymeyer shows up at their next meeting. Pay particular attention, please, to page 29, when they talk about the methodologies and they mention the 85th percentile. They get into that where it represents a speed at which people feel comfortable. 85% of your drivers are going to drive that speed irregardless of what you set the speed limit as. And that's where the traffic calming measures come in and take care of that situation. I think you'll also notice some roads look worse than others, but you need to take a look at the speed limit on that road. I believe over years, 
most likely based on resident complaints, <laughs> former city councils lowered a speed limit. And so it shows they're going much faster on road A versus road B, but really they're going roughly the same speed. One is just set at 20 and the other at 25. And in I, some cases, they're identical roads, or sometimes the, the road that's set at 20 is actually probably should be a little higher that should be in reverse. I, I live off Rannells, and I legitimately thought the speed limit was 30. Like, I was reading through this, and I was like, oh, I was some of those, uh, uh-huh. <laughs> So, Anthony, anywhere in that study, is there um, measures that talk about, you know, uh, making a more unified speed limit on those streets that have that? And, you know, I know Maplewood has a citywide speed limit of, I believe, 25. So is there a measure in there about that and maybe more signage? We can we can get into that. And that that's a good question for the traffic consultant. Like they they were suggesting, for example, West Bruno's speed limit be be raised quite frankly and and I, I i believe the residents would probably not take kindly to that and that's where i'd want to do a comprehensive approach to where if we eventually do that we put in some chicanes or potentially speed bumps and we obviously have to work with richmond heights on that you want to have a uniform speed limit but they also mentioned in the study and and this is kind of where you get the consultant and then you also get the staff and you have to try to meld that together they mentioned narrowing west bruno I believe you'd have a lot of angry residents because aside from speeding, uh, losing rear view mirrors due to the narrow nature of West Bruno is is a big, big complaint. They do mention eliminating truck traffic. OK, that's a good recommendation. But we need to make sure once we do that, we would also do it further south on Folk because. Councilmember Falkingham lives on Elm. Years ago, Flora, that block, had speed bumps. All that did was divert everybody to Elm. And so then we had to go back and correct that problem. So just remember, for every action, there's a reaction, especially when you have parallel roads. I believe that's why Rannells, they said that it's perplexing why Rannells is so, there's so many people speeding. I believe it's pretty simple. I believe they're trying to avoid Manchester. And they're making that turn and heading east-west. No, no, yeah, well... That's in our parking lot. We didn't get the study there. <laughs> but um, all in all, I was, you know, it, 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 there's definitely some good information to chew on. Uh, and, and I know I uh, received an email from uh, Council Member Maddox, and I, I hope I addressed your questions. But uh, any questions I get in the interim, I know we've got some time. If, as you're going through and trying to digest this, if you have any questions, please forward those directly to me. And then that way, the consultant, when they come, they can actually have uh specific answers to your to your questions so i'll i will mention what, what you'd said earlier about do we want to do some sort of uniformity um i it is may not be popular but it may not be a bad idea to have some uniformity there now there are some roads think of burgess by the ecc that road is probably or elm avenue kind of just uh basically just east of big bend that, that's 18 feet wide and there's parking on one side i mean that makes sense that it's 20 miles an hour. But there are other roads, Maple. It's a pretty wide open road. I don't know why Maple would be 25 and an adjacent road next to it. Elm would be, yeah. It's mm -hmm. So I'll make sure to bring that up. One question. For, oh, go ahead. <clears throat> um, there's a chart on page 47 and 48 that talks about the root prioritization tiers and kind of categorizes things based on where the speed infractions are based on tier. There are a very broad set of solutions there. Um, I'm curious if there's any, if anything has been done either by the consultant or staff to look at cost of those solutions and what's most cost effective in deciding which of those we can afford. There's no question the speed bumps or speed tables or speed humps are the cheapest. And, and, as council member Garcia indicated, they are effective. If you're going to do a chicane where you're essentially going to change the complete configuration of the road, um, it may make sense on Lindover as we rebuild the street. It doesn't make sense though, with a lot of our roads that we have problems that I'm rec making recommendations on Flora, Bellevue, um, Rannells, these are all brand new concrete roads. So that's why 
we put speed bumps in there as an option. Uh, the chicanes, you're you're looking at reconstructing portions of a road that you've just constructed. I, I think the speed bumps and speed humps or speed tables, I think, are going to be effective. We also talked about raising. I mentioned the raising the intersection at um, at Azel and Manchester. Um, something like that. Or remember when we do this bond issue, we're going to have some additional capital dollars that will that we wouldn't that we would normally be spending on roads that we could use for some of these projects. So the projects I'm recommending on our next agenda item, we can do projects on top of that. I assume we may be doing some ADA projects, additional ADA projects as well. And the council will have time to prioritize what they want. But I just want everyone to understand even what we have on our next item, those five uh, areas for traffic calming, we can expand that if need be. Um, a good example, too, with, with GRGs coming up to speak at our next uh, meeting, we are actually going to elevate the intersection at Greenwood as part of this um, GRG uh, and city combined project that's going to be reconstructing Greenwood Boulevard. And we're doing that for safety perspective, because as you're heading south on Sutton, going over the railroad tracks, there's a significant depression there. And if somebody's walking there, especially a child, it'd be difficult to see them. So we're going to raise it as much as we can. We can only go so high because we don't want to push water onto the adjacent properties to the south. But we we believe we can raise that intersection 18 inches to two feet, which will help safety. Yeah. <laughs> now, I know speed bumps are effective because I did get them on Elm and then Laura wanted to get them because it was pushing traffic their way. Um, I'm not going to yeah. going to stop the amount of cars. All, all you need to do is slow them down. Yes, it's really just the speed that kills uh, or hurts and injures people on property. Um, yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a big big fan of, of speed bumps, so. especially on some of these very narrow, very local roads. It, it it some of those numbers were surprising to me. There's no doubt about it. Does uh, is it okay for our plows? The current speed bumps it or... definitely slows us down. There's no doubt. It doesn't, but it doesn't wreck the. No, we, we usually pull the plow up. Okay. There we know where they are. Okay. Uh, it might require some hand digging if that's the case, but that's fine. Okay. We'll manage. Just a shout out to Public Works. They do an outstanding job with the streets that have the um, speed bumps because my street has peak speed bumps and it's never an issue when we have ice and snow. They just do a great job. So thank you. I can't say that enough. Those, the chicanes, how, how, what, how impactful are they on parking? I'm thinking of a street like Lindover where that's a premium. Yeah, they're very impactful on parking. Yeah. And so that's another reason why, and, and I'm again, this is this is not a shot in the, but a lot of times when a traffic consultant's coming in, they're just looking purely at, they're, they're, they have the tunnel vision and what they're tasked to do. But like I said, narrow the road. They don't realize we get those complaints about the mirrors or let's just go ahead and put chicanes throughout. They don't realize those neighbors when where, whoever has the green space or the bump out in front of their house, all of a sudden they can't park there anymore. And that that causes a lot of disruption, which is another reason why I recommended the speed bumps or the or the speed humps. They're aside from, you know, snow issues or occasionally we have debris. We had some debris on Marietta that was gathering by one of the speed bumps. We we shortened that and we so it made its way down to the drain. We have very few problems with those. They've been very effective too. Absolutely. I think there was something like 500 bolts they put in them. They was, yeah. When we bought them, they were going to be temporary for snow removal. <laughs> I remember the ones we put on floor. I remember the crew said, "This, these are not temporary. And I said, well, what do you mean? They said, come take a look. And we did. I was like, well, I said, hand shovels. So full, gave transparency. Me a dirty look. <laughs> full transparency. My email to Anthony was about what happens in situations like mine, and I am not the only street in Maplewood that shares part of a street with the city of STL, and what happens in situations like that, because I saw that the study only mentioned three entities maintaining the roads. Well, half of my street is Maplewood, and the other half is not. So he did kind of answer my questions um, about that and said that they have in the past have had a working relationship with the city when things needed to be repaired, sometimes the city has said no, and then Maplewood has just went ahead and made the repair if it was dire and needed and those types of things. So that's what my email and question was about. 
And we try to go, we try to avoid going across property lines, but Limit Avenue was the example where there were some potholes and we were doing some slabs that actually crossed. We finished the full slab replacement because it just made sense. Uh, West Bruno is a perfect example where Richmond Heights and Maplewood collaborated and we did that together. Um, and, and Limit, I envision we will probably be going a little further into St. Louis when that, I'm, I'm sorry, Blendon Place. Sorry, Blendon Place. I, I imagine we will have to go there. And what's ironic about Blendon Place is it cuts at an angle too. So I'm, I, I can assure you we will probably be going into the city for a while, but we always notify them well in advance, similar to utility. Hey, we're looking at doing these in the next three years. Could you please put this on your list? And, and they're, they're limited by funds in some cases. So, but we will not go right down the edge and have a weird boundary. So if any other questions come up, please feel free uh, to send those to me and I'll uh, forward those off to our traffic consultant. All right, thank you. The presentation, yes. you had the report, yeah, but the presentation will be on uh, October 24th during the council meeting. Okay, don't go too far. Yeah, or do we... I, do you have a copy of it? Yeah, I don't need to put it up there. I could go through it without the presentation. Okay. No, I wasn't going to do it through Zoom. I was just going to do it separately. Oh. Yeah. I'm not sure. I don't have to set up through Zoom. I'm not even on the network. Okay. Well, I can just do it. I can. I. I can go without. That's fine. Um, everyone got a copy. Got a copy. <laughs> That's a good point, Sean. <laughs> Can you get it out here, Matt? And you guys are all not helping you. Oh, it's just all good. Right. Yeah. 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 And you want to do your slide, Jeff? That That's fine. Yes. Um, if you want to just skip ahead to the uh, first side, please. So, wait, wait, wait just a minute. Oh, ew. <laughs> That's from this, probably. No, it's me. <laughs> so, is that the first slide? So we've all we've all got a copy of the, the presentation which is up and essentially I just want to make sure um you know, we oh I apologize. Bond issue potential capital projects. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize. So the, the idea and what I what staff tried to do is we're trying to essentially get guidance from the council on what specific project we want. I talked to uh, finance director uh, Lexi Miller and she said we're going to be getting about six million, which is I believe what the council has decided. So I tried to come up with projects uh, that would basically equal six million. If the council wants to add more roads, more sidewalk projects, more street lights please let me know we can essentially move these move these projects around. But to start off, we ended up updating our city map. We update our city uh, streets map, our streets inventory and ratings. We update that annually, but we every three years we do a deep dive and we did a deep dive this year. 
And I've also got a separate spreadsheet if anyone's ever interested with every road in town. It's about a 250 page Excel spreadsheet, which I can send you. And you can kind of see approximately what it would cost to fix your road and asphalt versus concrete. It makes several assumptions. So it's not a perfect science, but for the roads we're recommending, we're very comfortable with these with these numbers. Um, obviously the 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 streets, the the pink uh and and the kind of a, the beige, which are the uh three and the four. Those are the worst streets in town right now. And we are basically with the $6 million bond issue, which with the city streets um, I've, I've put on that table, um, which would be your next slide, if you don't mind. Um, we basically would get rid of all but a handful of fours on our scale. We did one five. Uh, which sounds somewhat counterintuitive. Why would we do that? But that's the north end of Burdell, just south of West Bruno. It's in decent shape now, but there's some alligator cracking and there's some other there's some other wear and tear that it, it's starting to look bad. And considering the volume we get, and we may not be doing this till 25, I believe, for example, it's going to be in worse driving shape than, say, Valley Avenue, which gets a lot lower volume, lower speeds right now, and Valley would be a little lower. But we basically could knock out nearly all of our roads that are in what I would consider poor shape. If you could go to the next slide. Um, towards the bottom, we talked earlier about the traffic calming measures, the speed bumps, the speed humps. I've thrown some uh, estimates in there so we could essentially knock out the five roads, um, the five problem roads that there are others, as I've mentioned, that we could use typical capital development funds or traditional capital development funds, not the bond funds to, to expand that as well. Um, I've put in uh, uh, solar streetlights. I know that's been a, a big uh, interest of the Sustainability Commission. I met with them last Wednesday. They were uh, excited about the po possibility. There's some dark spots in town and they really want to, to use the utilize the solar streetlights. Brentwood has done some of these and they've the good news is they've kind of gone through a little trial and error with theirs. They've they've started off with some cheaper ones, which were much more difficult. They had to have someone install them for them. So it, the cheaper lights really didn't end up being cheaper. Then they ended up going with some that are wrapped. So they don't really look like solar street lights where you have the kind of ugly, you know, solar panel up front. They're kind of wrapped around the panels are actually wrapped around the pole. They look very nice. They're about, they were roughly about $7,800. And I spoke with the public works director at Brentwood. Uh, he indicated he would show us how we could install them ourselves. And he's assured us. So that's drove these costs down. It's probably cut the cost, the cost in half. I threw 25 in there. Obviously that number can be adjusted. Um, and when I talked to the sustainability commission, we figured we would try to do some in-house studies. They have very sensitive light readers where we could go out and measure the foot candles and try to figure out problem areas in town so we don't have to pay for a study and we can just essentially insert these in the middle of a block that's currently dark um and the nice thing about them is there is uh no monthly maintenance charge now we would obviously have to do that ourselves but for the most part they say these things uh, have a pretty good uh, 10 15 20 year life on them now, they're not going to be quite as bright as some of our led lights but Again, if you have a dark area, you install a solar street light. That makes the difference. Um, and the last thing I put in there, I put some standalone isolated uh, sidewalk replacements, and I put four hundred and forty-seven thousand five hundred dollars, basically, to round up to get to six million. Uh, Matt, can you please put the next slide down? To give, it's tough to say what is four hundred and forty-seven thousand five hundred going to do for me. So I I put in all the sidewalks we did this year which totaled 259,000. Uh, and that gives you an idea. Um, and Matt, is it possible to go to the next slide? Thank you. So this is kind of what I'm trying to get into. I need, we need obviously promotional or educational or informational materials for the, for the, for the citizens. What I'm hoping to do is take those isolated sidewalk repairs and I'm gonna target areas where we're not doing new roads, new sidewalks entirely, or we're not doing traffic calming measures because we're trying to ascend. This is going to be a citywide vote. So I want to try to spread the wealth and spread the projects citywide where possible. So that would be the one thing I would suggest is to make sure we do have some uh, money in there for isolated sidewalk repairs, because the idea is to try to fill this map up as much as possible. Um, and like I said, the more 
projects you can do, I think the higher likelihood you're going to get this 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 bond issue passed. Does anyone have any additional uh, any questions on on this, or is there um, maybe a need for a work session to whittle down these projects, or are we comfortable? I think we still have some time if if we're not sure. We need to um, collaborate at all with the school district if we would look at doing anything with like speed bumps or anything like that, just because of the bus route impacts. We have not done so. We've never had any complaints before. It's not a bad idea, but I don't think they're going to, I mean, the buses can go over them. I mean, let's hope the buses aren't speeding. <laughs> that wouldn't be good. Yeah. The, the, the speed bumps or humps that we have, I mean, they, they can, any vehicle, any passenger, any truck, any, we have trash trucks and things of that nature going over them. They're very sturdy, very sturdy. Like, the ones we have are probably 20 years old. Yeah, and if you go look at them, I mean, it's, yeah. The, the, the speed humps, you know, for example, on Lindover, we may do the, the, if you've been to the city of St. Louis, you've probably seen some of those asphalt humps. We'll probably do some of those because we can get a few more of those in. They're, they're a little cheaper. And Lindover is eventually going to most likely be replaced. The good thing about the speed bumps, the hard rubberized speed bumps, is if we do need to move them in the future, we can. Uh, I don't envision that though, because once you put them in, they're 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 pretty much there for good. Um, but I think uh, at this point, I mean, assuming the council is okay with it, I plan on reaching out to Richmond Heights and start and and conveying our results uh, on West Bruno and seeing if they have any interest in looking at future projects, future traffic calming enhancements. I believe they will. I know it's been a problem there as well. And I know that um, they've had discussions with Crawford Bunty Braymeyer about a speed study in Richmond Heights. They just haven't pulled the trigger yet, but I know that they're looking at that. And I know West Bruno's one street that they're looking at as well. Is there anything um, that you have in this presentation but about changing the green? Like in the same location? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so if you look at um, uh, Greenwood Boulevard, you can see there's a, uh, I've put the money, I put our matching funds. So the overall project will probably be, yeah, if I had to guess, because I mean, we're talking constructions off in 25 and we've already paid portions of some engineering costs for that. Uh, it'd be about 2.3 million and our matching portion will be about $350,000. So I put that on this map because we would use our money from this bond issue to pay for our matching portion. And also adds the, an additional road. I also put preliminary engineering in for Laclede Station Road, basically from Weaver South, or I'm sorry, from Randall South to Manchester. Uh, and I put construction in 2028, because anytime you do these federal projects, it, it you're typically about five years out. I'm going to apply for that grant um, in February of next year, because even if you drive the road now, it's not too bad, but our crews do a lot of patching on it. That's usually where I look at where that's usually when I tell the, I always look at patching numbers and potholes and, and crack ceiling. And that's where I start to look for where these roads are. Um, you can also look for settlement issues. Is there subsidence? These are, this is when you know when you, these are the roads that need to go. And so even if the driving is not too bad, there are problems there. Um, but we've got, a, and this, this should be able to get, a pretty good chunk. I think I'm excited about the ADA access to the rear of City Hall. That would be a, um, we would have to reconfigure our parking lot. Basically, the spots you see in the back would be too short. Uh, we'd probably have to add three because if we're going to do an improvement, we'd have to include the parking over here as well to meet ADA. So we'd probably have three spots back there. You'd have a, a series of ramps leading yourself up. You've got about a four foot drop there. So um, it's a, it's one inch for every foot of rise. So it's going to be a substantial um, ramp up to city hall. And then we're going to, that also includes hardware for the automatic accessibility. So, you know, if you're a disabled individual, you just push the button, the door will flop open right now. It's kind of a travesty what we have back there. <laughs> um, it's not in compliance with ADA. And that's where I felt comfortable putting that one in there because I know when we do our study, that's going to be on there. And I think the 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 door to the city, the city hall, we want to make sure we're obviously welcoming to individuals that are disabled. We've got an elevator, we've got all the other things, but getting to the building is a problem. So I 
I would ask for the council to entertain one more work session on this. Um, and at the next work session, we can really dive into what council believes is a priority and have that conversation with Anthony, because of course he's an expert on this. But then also I would like for council to consider the possibility that a, a part of the bond should the community pass it can be used to um, I guess reimburse the city on projects that were completed before the bond was passed. Um, excuse me, I spoke with Lexi Miller about this in April, April of this year. Um, so I had a conversation with her and as well as Lorenzo Boyd, and he let us both know that there was an ordinance that the city could pass that would allow us to reimburse ourselves for projects that we are doing. And so I just want to, I'd like to, to see um, what number, what amount, not number, what, what amount we could, re we could seek to for reimbursement from the bond. Um, that would go back into our funds and, you know, really assist our, our budget a bit. Um, so if we could have that discussion along with the discussion with you, Anthony, that would be great. Um, just a couple updates, and I didn't put the uh, railroad gate project at, at at Sutton and and Greenwood in because we're so reliant on on Union Pacific, but we're at seventy percent complete on those plans. I'm hoping that uh, by this time next year those new gates will be going in. And then uh, we hit, we hit one we hit one more slide. And this is off the subject. I'm assuming unless there's questions, we've been getting a lot of calls about. Um, the mid-block crossing at Manchester. Unfortunately, people don't realize that state law says you need to stop for people. And so people are hitting the flashing beacon. It's called a rapid flashing beacon. And they're walking across, kind of assuming the cars are going to stop. And so I'm thinking of a good way to do some promotion, some educational awareness. We just today ordered six of these signs. We're going to probably have two out there permanently. I know it's might be considered overkill, but not with the number of calls I'm getting. And then we're going to take the others and move them essentially all around town to some of the most busy crosswalks, to some that maybe are in a neighborhood that aren't quite so busy, and just try to make sure drivers in town are aware that if there is a pedestrian in there, regardless if they have a signal or not, they have to yield. That's state law. So we are, if you see those and you wonder why it's because we're getting a lot of inquiries about it. Well, thank you because I I use that crosswalk on Manchester yeah. and someone yelled at me. Assuming you were wrong. And I went back and I was like, it's the law. And then they were like, I'm going to see it. So I appreciate this coming out. You won't get any complaints from me. Did you tell me you're the mayor? No, <laughs> I didn't do that. I didn't. <laughs> The next thing they do, the person is like right here on their car. I guess waiting for them, and there's actually hand coworkers. Oh, like, like someone hit someone because they didn't hit the button. Yeah, like this time of night. So yeah. I had the opposite call. One nice thing is that mid-block crossing is getting a lot of use. It's yeah. very nice to see. You assumed it would because it was such a large block, and you could see people darting. And not that people don't still do that, but it is it is a nice option. So. Anyway, be on the lookout for that. I'm back, going back just a moment, and I know we're running out of time, but is that when you're looking at the difference between reconstruction with concrete and asphalt overtopping, is it just cost and severity? Those are the two main things, or is there other? There's there's a number of factors. Okay. Most likely, we look at try to determine what the base is underneath, and gotcha. we can look at that from societies. We can look at that from other issues, and we can look at that from how the how the asphalt is breaking up or how the concrete's breaking up. So it's mostly a technical apron consideration. Even the number of aprons, we'll look at all of those factors. Gotcha. Uh, we try to do concrete where possible, but asphalt, a good asphalt overlay, if done properly, can last 20 years and it's much cheaper. So we try to mix it around. We also cool. try if we have a contiguous block um, to try it to make it a little more consistent if possible. Most people prefer the concrete <laughs> for obvious reasons. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you.
May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. We are adjourned. Thank you.